We spend our whole lives running, searching for something to make life all we hoped it could be. Soon we're running scared from hurt we feel and hurts we've caused. But mostly, we run from God. We just know if he ever catches us, it's over. But nobody can run forever. And when the day comes to face the one who's chased us all these years, we discover something amazing, but true. He isn't out to get us. He's out to love us and make us all we're created to be. Pursued God's divine obsession with you. I'm going to start with a story this morning that I would really like to be able to say this is not a true story. I'm kind of hesitant to, to share this story uh, because I'm not the hero of this story. And uh, we have a, uh, a couple of law enforcement people here in our midst too. I would really rather have them think good things about me. Um, but here it goes anyway. It's, I had a wedding in Denver a few years back and, and uh, I, was, I was driving uh, down the interstate to, uh, to get to this wedding. And you know me well enough to know that if I'm not at a wedding about an hour early, I'm late. And uh, I, I was running a little bit later than this, and it was going to be like I was going to be there a half an hour to 45 minutes early. And for some reason, my, my uh, foot just didn't obey my mind. And it uh, pushed down on the gas pedal just a little too hard. And uh, sure enough, happened at the right time. And, and uh, I see the lights behind me flashing. And, and the guy pulls me over and uh, asks for, my, asks for my, uh, my license and my registration, which I, I gladly gave him in... Uh, then he said, do you know that you were going several miles an hour over the speed limit? And I said, yeah, I do. And I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to make excuses because honestly, I always think that, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're caught, you're caught and, and you know what. And I said, I'm not trying to make excuses, but I just want you to know that I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm on a way to a wedding. And so if you could give me my ticket quickly, um, that would be very helpful. I promise I won't speed, but if we could get this, that, that would be helpful. And, and he said, well, oh, you're, you're a pastor. He said, that, that's a really great excuse. <laughs> he says, if you're really a pastor, why don't you tell me what John 1.1 1, 1 says? And so I said, <clears throat> N-R-K ha lagas. Eitan weon. Tan lagas. And this guy is looking at me with his mouth open and, and, and you know, like I had the horn drawn out the side of my head. He, he says, what are you doing? I said, oh, you meant in English. I, I thought you meant for me to give it to you in Greek. And uh, so I told him in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he let me off with, with uh, just a warning that I didn't deserve because um, I was speeding, and uh, there's no excuse for that. And uh, it just made, I, I don't know exactly why I was thinking about that this week when I was preparing this message, but I know that none of you have ever done anything like that in your lives. I, 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 can, I can appreciate that. And you probably don't have this feeling of dread when you see the lights on flashing on top of the car that are behind you. I'm sure that you have only good feelings, like he's going to stop you and tell you what a wonderful driver you are. Um, I'm sure that's the way it is, it is in your life. But, you know, the problem is, is that even, even I, I am so conditioned, I, I am so horrible that even if I am doing everything right, when I see that police car behind me, 
or particularly if I see some lights flashing behind me, I'm certain that I'm doing something wrong and and he's out to get me. Even if I haven't been doing anything wrong, even if I've been under the speed limit or if I've been paying attention to all the rules of the road. And what I was thinking about this week is how often we transfer that mentality over to God. And we think about meeting up with God as if it's a bad thing. We think about the fact that, yes, we as Christians, we're supposed to say, you know what, we know that the Lord's coming back to get us, and, and, and we're really anxious, and, and we're happy for the Lord's return, but there are times that we don't want the Lord to see us doing what we're doing if he returns, like we're, if we're in the cinema, and we're watching a movie that we're thinking, maybe God... If he came back, he really wouldn't like this movie that I'm watching. I generally think, I hope that God doesn't come back during this movie because I'd really like to see how it ends. Um, But uh, we, we get that mentality going in our minds. And the fact of the matter is that we run from God when we see or when we feel him coming because we think that there's something going on in our life that's bad. And then we realize our conversion. And you know what the thing is is about most of us in our conversion is that we stop running from God. We really do. We, we say, you know what, I, I think that's okay, and so I'm going to stop running from God, but now I'm going to start running for God. And we think that we have to prove our worth. We have to think that I need to do enough things to make God say, oh yeah, I guess that was a pretty good decision to save him. And we start doing things like we spend extra time at church, or we pray more, or we read more of our Bibles. We're just trying to make up ground to make ourselves feel better about the fact that God has saved to us. Let me suggest to you this morning that if you are running from God, and if you are running for God, it's time to stop. Because you've missed something. And what I'd like to do this morning is I would like to share an even more important principle with you. And that's that you don't have to run from God. And you don't have to run for God. But you can run to God. And you can rest in Him. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning that as we take a look into Your Word that we might allow it to penetrate our hearts. Father, I pray that you would forgive my, my many sins and that you would speak through me despite myself to, to help my friends here this morning. Father, help us, to, help us to realize today that you are on our side and you want only good things for us. And so, Father, help us, help us to run to you. And I'm so thankful that you have made that possible in Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we pray. Amen. So I want to illustrate that point this morning. And to do that, I want to use kind of an obscure passage of Scripture in your Bible that that probably you may not be completely familiar with. So if you've got your Bible or your phone apps or whatever you might have with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Hosea. Now, Hosea is one of the minor prophets, and realize that I said Hosea, not Jose. Okay, it starts with an H. And uh, you, will find, you will find Hosea in that part of your Bible that seldom gets used. And so that's why this electronic stuff is so much better, because you can punch in Hosea and get there. He is a minor prophet. And it's a story that you probably don't hear a lot about. As a matter of fact, I don't think when I was growing up as a child they ever made flannel graph figurines of the story of Hosea and put it up there for us to go through and those kind of things. Because the story, to be honest with you, the story is a little bit out there. But although the story is out there, it is incredibly significant because the book of Hosea, the story of Hosea, 
is the picture of God's love for us. Now, specifically, it's the picture of God's love for the nation of Israel, but that obviously translates to us as his people. And a story starts out with God asking Hosea to do something radical. Now, as a matter of fact, God is going to, do, go, going to ask Hosea to do something that God has never asked anyone to do before, and God has never asked anyone to do this since. Because God wants Hosea to speak to the people of Israel, and I think to speak to us in a lot of ways. Because Israel has betrayed God, they have turned away from God, and they are worshiping other gods. And so God sends Hosea to speak to the children of Israel. And God tells Hosea, I not only want you to speak to my people, but I want you to experience my pain. I want you to know what it feels like for my people to have turned away from me and to have chased after other things that they saw as more important than me. I want you to feel that pain so that you really get it. And so, here's where it starts. God comes to Hosea and he says, I want you to marry a prostitute. Okay. Now, not only do I want you to marry a prostitute, Hosea, but this prostitute is going to remain unfaithful. And she's going to have children who are born in this unfaithfulness because I want you to feel my pain. And maybe you will get it, and maybe you will be able to share that with my people, the children of Israel. Now realize that the book of Hosea is not marriage advice. It is a picture of God's love for us. Hosea chapter 1. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, now you see that I'm not making this stuff up. Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So, Hosea married Gomer. Okay, let's get this over with. Whenever we hear the name Gomer, the only thing we think of is Gomer Pyle. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And I tell you what, that's pretty appropriate here because surprise, surprise, you are going to marry a prostitute. I mean, this is a crazy story. But what God is doing is he is illustrating his radical love and faithfulness to the children of Israel. And that, my friends, is the kind of God that you can run to, that you don't have to run from, and you don't have to run for, but you can run to. And so my first challenge to you, and I'm going to give you three of them this morning. My first challenge to you is very simply this. Say yes to relationship with God. Now, it's interesting that if, if you were to look in, in your Bibles, particularly your New Testament, you would see that there are all kinds of places where the Bible uses the illustration of marriage to talk about uh, the, our relationship with God. There's that great passage in the book of Ephesians. Uh, I love that passage because it talks about the responsibilities of the husband and, and wives, and it gets people into all kinds of knots uh, tied up and gets people into all kinds of arguments over the whole thing. And... Uh, about who's to be submissive and how we're supposed to be submissive. And you know what? The, in, the interesting thing to me is that the very last verse in that passage of Scripture says, do you really think I'm talking about marriage? No, 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 I'm, I'm talking about Christ in the church. But it's one of those pictures, and God uses that illustration throughout the New Testament. And it's interesting to me that the first time that God uses that illustration of his relationship and equates it with the idea of marriage, it is not a fairy tale picture. It is not pretty at all. I mean, it is down and dirty. It is the prophet and the prostitute. 
There is no prince involved. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I'm telling you Jerry Springer would kill to have these kind of stories on his show. But this is real. And the real story here is that God is faithful to us, his children. God is faithful to us. And he only wants what's best, what's best for us in the midst of his faithfulness. God desires for us that we would have with him a relationship that is far deeper than what we tend to know. Performed a wedding ceremony last night. And one of the things that I make a point to, to talk to couples and, and people who are there is to share that a marriage is not a contract. A marriage is a covenant that you share in. Because we tend to think in terms of contract. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you had your first mortgage. You know what it's like to, to sign your first mortgage. You know, you, you, you're, you, you walk in and the first thing they do is they hand you this one piece of paper and you fill out this piece of paper and you think, oh, this is going to be this is going to be pretty simple. And then he reaches behind him or she reaches behind her and they pull out this stack that's about this tall and says that you're going to get all of these things. And so you start off when you're signing all of these contracts, you start reading all of these things. And by about the third page, your eyes get really blurry and you're going, I can't read this stuff. And you just start signing things and start signing things. And pretty soon, you know, after about four and a half hours of nothing, when you're just about dead, the guy looks you in the eye and he says, Mr. Hardy, you can keep the pen. And you go, yeah, great. What a wonderful gift that you, oh, that has made it all worth it. I get to keep this wonderful pen after I can't, I mean, you're walking around like this, you can't, you can't use your arm for the next week. But that's the way we tend to see our relationship with God sometimes as, as a contract that we have to keep signing and, and we drift into times when we do this with him. Or worse yet, we get into think we're, we start bargaining with God. So God, how about if I keep these things? Are, are you going to be really good to me? Are good things going to happen to me if, if, if I follow along with you? And we miss the point. What I'm saying is we need to begin by saying yes to a real relationship with God and run to Him. Run to Him. You get to know Him more and more, not out of duty, but to get closer to Him. Of course, you get closer to God with doing things like reading about him. But you don't read so you can say, okay, man, I'm glad I got this checked off. And, or, or you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to do this, read through the Bible program in a year, and, and you, you start falling behind about the same time that you fall behind on your New Year's resolutions. And, and you're saying, oh, I've just got to make it up. And you start feeling guilty about the whole thing, and you miss the point. Of course, reading in the Bible as long as it's done with, with the right respect and attitude, brings you closer to the heart of God. But if you're doing it just to make up ground, you're going to miss something. The same is true with prayer. Of course we speak to God, and of course we get closer to Him in prayer, but if we're just doing it because we feel like this is something that we have to do or something that's going to pay for our salvation, we're missing something. We're missing something. Say yes to a relationship with God. Second challenge I want to level to you this morning is this is to move from grace or for, move from good to grace. Move from good to grace. Now we all know that there is a price to be paid for sin. That's the way it's set up. Doesn't matter what the sin is. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter if you try to legislate your sin away and make it say, well, it's a social norm and all those things. If God calls it a sin, it's a sin. No matter what you try to do with it. And I would recommend to you that you not try to rearrange God's design and, and, and that you wouldn't say, well, this isn't a sin and this isn't a sin and this isn't a sin. I mean, this really, this, this isn't really greed. This is me just trying to get ahead. No, it's not. It's greed. It's called what is. It's a sin. And we struggle with that. 
And we know that because of that, there is a price that has to be paid. And we know that God doesn't see any differentiation in sins, and so we are all guilty. And when we're running from God, that just drives us and drives us and drives us and drives us. And then we start running for God, and we know that Jesus paid the price, but we're still trying to repay things. But when you run to Him, when you move from good to grace, you know that God paid the price. Let's go on with our story. Now, let me set this up. Is when we get to chapter 3, Gomer's gone again. I mean, Hosea is a single dad, and he's raising these kids who aren't even really his kids. I mean, he is doing just whatever he can to make it through. And I suppose there are nights he's going, man, I wonder if she's coming home. And then there are probably nights when she comes home, and he wonders why in the world did I hope that she would come home. And so here's, here's what God says. Go and love your wife again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, this will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love, and they love to worship them. I mean, this is incredible. He's not waiting at home for, for her to come home anymore. He's going out to, for, to find her. He's going out to find her. And then the next verse goes on to say this. It, 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 it talks about the process of, of, of furthering this one. So he says, I, I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. So he goes out, he finds Gomer, and he buys her back. And this is what God is saying. Here's how I handle infidelity. Go out and buy her back. Do you get this picture? I mean, Hosea, here is a nice, normal guy. He's raising these kids who really aren't his. Single dad, doing a great job. And God says, oh, by the way, go buy her back. And so he has to go to the red light district. He has to find her pimp. And he has to buy her back. Because God said, I want you to see, this is how I love you. It's interesting here, as you look at these figures here, somebody did a study on this, is that the price that's being paid there is equal to the price that's being paid for a normal slave. And so he buys her back. He buys her back. And God says, that's how I love you. That's how I love you. I buy them back. God says, I will find you, and no matter what, I will bring you home. Do you hear that? No matter what, I will find you and bring you home. Friends, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Is that no one, no one, no one is beyond redemption. No matter what, I will find you, and I will bring you home. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Only Jesus is good. And God brought us home. And so in gratitude, we don't have to run from God. We don't have to run for God, but we get to run to God. And we get to rest in him. One more thing. I want to challenge you to live in this new identity. We tend to live in this realm that says, you know what, if you are a real Christian, you will do these things. And sometimes people level those accusations against us. Generally, it's at the worst possible time. You know what, if you are a real Christian, you wouldn't do this. And so we tend to buy into that nonsense. 
And we tend to try to live up to that. And we find ourselves time after time after time after time falling flat on our faces. And there's a reason for that. Because we're never going to make it in the first place. Do you realize First John says that we love not because we thought it was a good idea or because we conjured this up in our brain. It says we love because he first loved us and he gave himself as a sacrifice for us. That's our identity. That's our identity. Look at that third verse in chapter 3 of Hosea. It's where the story starts to take on even a little bit of a deeper picture. This is Hosea speaking. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone. Not even me. Now, don't get stuck in this stuff here. Look at what's really happening here. She is getting a chance to start all over. She is getting a perfect chance to start all over. And she has a chance to embrace this new identity of Jose going out and finding her and buying her and bringing her back home. And she has a chance to embrace her identity, not as a prostitute, but as a wife. Not as unfaithful, but as faithful. Not as someone who is unloved, but someone who is loved. She has been sought, she has been bought, and now she has been brought back. And that's us. Now, of course, there are changes that have to be made. Remember Jesus, he catches, they, they catch a woman in adultery and they bring this woman before Jesus. And Jesus, says, whoever, whoever is perfect among you, why don't you toss the first rock? And we got a society out there that likes to end the story there, and that's not where the story ends. The story ends when they walk away and Jesus looks at her and says, don't go and sin. I, I, I want you to leave and I, I don't want you to sin anymore. Because when you come to me, when you rest in me, you can be changed. You can be changed. And as, as a follower of Christ, we are changed. But understand this, friends. The change has its roots, not in our desire or in our willpower, but in the love of God. Do you have it? The change has its roots not in the desires or the willpower of men, but in the love of God. You have it. Last spiritual conversation that I had with my mother. We'd just gotten back to, to the uh, assisted living from our our, our last battle at the hospital. And I said, Mom, what's, what's it like? What's it like to know that you are now in the home stretch of this race that we've been running all of our lives? What, what's that feel like? To be so close to the end that you can taste it. And I was saddened by her response. Because her, her response was, Lane, I, I just hope I've, I hope I've done well enough. And I said, you know what, Mom? You haven't. That's a real good thing to tell your 87-year-old mother who's about to die. I said, you know what, Mom? You haven't done good enough. So, Mom, you did a heck of a job. But have you done good enough? No, you have not done good enough. Because if you had done good enough, then that man who died on a hill in Calvary 2,000 years ago died for nothing. Because he died because none of us are good enough. No matter how hard we run for God, 
No matter how many good things we do or try to do, we are never good enough. But let me tell you the good news is that He has pursued you. He continues to pursue you with everything that He has. With everything that He is. Simple question, isn't it? Which way are you running? If you're running from God, it's time to stop. He's still chasing you. He's always going to chase you. But if you're running from him, it's time to stop. I, I don't know where you're at this morning. I, I don't know exactly where you're at. There may be things going on in your life that I, I haven't got the slightest idea what they are. Even as well as we know each other. If you're running from God, stop. And if you're trying to run for God, if you're trying to make it up so that you can say at the end of your life, I think I did good enough, well, good for you. But stop. Stop running for him and start running to him. Because he loves you. And Father, I pray this morning that we might know that love. That we might understand that you died for us so that the price has been paid. And we are so grateful for that, Father. Father, I pray for my friends this morning that they might know the fullness of your grace. And knowing that you're going to change us, but you're changing us out of love and with love. Help us to allow you to mold us. Help us just to rest in you because the price has been paid. In Jesus' name.